It's great to be here and thank you to the ECGI for partnering with the Centre for Corporate Governance and to everybody for, for attending. So this paper is co-authored with Tom and also with Dirk Genta, a professor at LSE. And what we're doing in this paper is we're surveying both investors and directors on how they set CEO pay in practice. And interestingly, this is a quite different research methodology to what academics typically use. So academic research typically does one of two things. One is to use theory. So what you do in theory is you build models of how a board should set pay, similar in spirit to how you might model a coronavirus pandemic and use that model to try to figure out the optimal government response. And so these models have been pretty influential, just like they have in the pandemic. Indeed, Bengt Holmström and Oliver Hart won the Nobel Prize a few years ago due to their contributions in modeling the pay setting process. But one concern that many people have is models make unrealistic assumptions because they need to simplify things. But in fact, something being unrealistic is not necessarily a bad thing. If you consider the map of the London Underground, that is unrealistic in, the, in that the central line is not truly a straight line. But in fact, that lack of realism actually makes the tube map more useful because it's easier to operate than if that line was actually truly realistic. So one of the goals of the survey is to figure out which of the unrealistic features of our current models are innocuous and which are not and should be changed. So one contribution is to try to guide future theory. The second way in which academics typically do studies is doing evidence empirical analysis. So what they might do is to say, is pay linked to performance? Now, that's something you can get clear results. However, what's difficult is we don't know why. Like we could document a relationship, but is this because pay is used to motivate the CEO to perform better? Is this because a sensitive contract, one where pay is linked to performance, is a way of attracting CEOs who are performance hungry? Or are there other reasons? Again, by asking the practitioners who set and vote on pay schemes, we hope to shed additional light on this question over and above what we can typically see from academic research. So who are we surveying? And I think some of these people we surveyed uh, um, on this um, webinar. So thank you so much to everybody who participated. We looked at directors of FTSE all share companies and investors. This is both fund managers and corporate governance professionals at asset managers and asset owners who invest in the UK. And one of the most interesting things to come out of the survey is how directors and investors might agree on some things, but also disagree on others. And so it's great to be followed by a leading director and a leading investor. So let me go to the results. Now, the first set of questions we asked is on the objectives and constraints of CEO pay. So what is the goal of a board when it chooses a particular pay contract? And what are the constraints that they view themselves as operating under? Going back to standard academic research, in our models, pay has three objectives. The goal of a board is to set pay as low as possible while ensuring that the CEO stays there, doesn't quit, and also ensuring that the CEO is incentivized. Those are the three basic things. So our first question is, well, how important are those three? So rank the importance of these goals when setting CEO pay. We ask this to directors and investors. And the first result I'd like you to focus on is the bottom one, the one that was ranked as least important by both directors and investors is keeping the level of pay down. And this itself is really interesting, right? The level of pay gets lots of attention in the media and by policymakers but at least compared to retaining the CEO and incentivizing her to create value, this is seen as third order. And some of you might know the models by Gabex and Londier, arguing that the CEO has such a large effect on firm value that it's worth paying top dollar for top talent. It's worth paying what is required to attract the best CEO and also ensure that she's properly incentivized. So that's something on which directors and investors both agree. Both of them, the overwhelming majority, argued that the level of pay was least important. But where might there be some disagreement? It's on the first two. So while directors 
thought that attracting the right CEO is most important. Investors thought that designing a pay structure that motivates the CEO is slightly more important than getting the right person in charge. So loosely speaking, boards focus more on retention and investors focus more on incentivization. And there could be three reasons for this disagreement. Now, one reason, which is mainly there in the academic literature, mostly by Lucian Bebchuk, is he argues that boards are just weak. So just to caricature what he argues, boards are just too lazy to try to put down the pressure and pay. Maybe they have their own incentives. They might think that the CEO will reciprocate in some way and so forth. However, there might be other reasons for this, which might be that boards do genuinely want to maximize long-term shareholder value, but they just view the world differently from investors. So one of them, it might be that boards do try to do the right thing, but they might be uninformed. They think that pay is needed to attract the right CEO, but they might not realize that the labor market for direct for CEOs could actually be much deeper than they might otherwise think. Again, to caricature it, Perhaps if they were to look outside the old boys clubs of potential CEOs, they might see that there's a broader market and actually you can put down with pressure and pay without actually reducing the quality of your CEO. But on the flip side, maybe it's investors who are uninformed. Investors are saying lower pay, tie pay more to performance, make CEOs work longer before they can actually cash out. But actually, directors might say, well, you don't actually know the vagaries of the CEO labor market. Actually, the number of people who can run this company well is very scarce. So the changes that investors push for might actually paradoxically reduce shareholder value. Now, in order to evaluate who's right, we try to answer ask the following questions. Now, if you were forced to offer lower pay because of investor pressure or other external pressures, what were the consequences of that? If you believe the standard academic models where pay is set optimally, the only consequence of being forced to offer lower pay is that the CEO quits. Again, if the contract was optimal, you would be paying the CEO the minimum you could get away with. And therefore, if you're forced to offer lower pay because of external pressure, the CEO quits. But interestingly, we found that this was very rare. 41% of directors admitted that even if external pressure caused them to offer lower pay, there were no adverse consequences. And this is surprising. Let's just highlight how surprising this is. What directors admitted to doing was because of external pressure, they were forced to offer lower pay than they would have done otherwise, and there was no adverse consequences. So here, that suggests that at least in some cases, actually boards themselves did not put significant, sufficient downward restraint on pay. They needed external pressure to force them to do the right thing. But the flip side is that in the same amount of cases, there were adverse consequences, which was the CEO was less motivated. I know this is really interesting because all we asked in this question was about the quantum, the level of pay, not the structure of pay. Well, in standard academic models, and also many practitioners believe that how you motivate pay is the structure, the sensitivity of pay for performance, how much pay changes if you succeed versus if you don't. But what this is saying is that the sheer level of a CEO's pay motivates them. And the main reason for this, which came up in many times in the survey, is this idea of fairness. Now, fairness is a pretty vague word, but to make it more concrete, what does fairness mean? Is when a CEO decides as to how much effort to put in, she will think about her pay and compare it to a reference point, which determines whether she thinks pay is fair. And if pay is above that reference point, then the CEO's intrinsic motivation will kick in. But if pay is below that reference point, they might feel demotivated. And notice this is a quite different view of pay than in standard models. In a standard model, why does the CEO care about pay? 
because she uses it to finance consumption. She uses it to buy stuff. And that leads to criticisms. Well, CEOs are already wealthy. Why are they motivated by more pay? Instead, the argument is slightly different, is well, pay is a measure of how much the board and how much investors value her. And if you are underpaid, you just feel your sense of worth has been eroded. And that's just human in any of our jobs. Like we might not feel the same motivation, no matter how passionate we are for our profession, if we don't think we're being treated fair. And the next set of questions looks at how much value would you sacrifice in terms of shareholder value to avoid controversy on CEO pay by outside forces. Right, so why is this interesting? In a standard model, like the CEO and the board just bargains with each other, they choose a contract that just both of them agree on. But as we know, pay is played out in the court of public opinion, and there's many other parties which are, at the, at which are influencing the pay process. Two thirds of directors and over half of investors would willingly sacrifice shareholder value to avoid other people getting upset. So these other constraints are serious. And where do these constraints come from? Interestingly, 88% of directors either agreed or strongly agreed that investors are the main source of constraints. And let me just pause here and highlight, well, why is that so surprising? Well, if directors and investors agreed on what the optimal contract is, right, our goal is to set a low pay, but make sure that we've got the right CEO, if they both agreed on the, the correct contract, if they have the same model of the world, then directors would simply offer the clearly best contract and investors would automatically applaud, they'd automatically vote for it. So the fact that directors believe they need to sacrifice shareholder value to satisfy shareholders' constraints and preferences is really bizarre, because what that suggests is that schemes that we set up like say on pay, which should be in shareholders' interest, might actually be paradoxically harming shareholder value. Why? Let me stand in the board's corner, right? Setting pay is a really complicated process, right? They need to have deep knowledge of the CEO, her motivation, high consultants, maybe investors who are spread too thinly across lots of companies. They don't understand the complexities of this particular situation. And so having shareholders having oversight is like micromanagement. One director responded, shareholders appoint Remco's and then seek to micromanage their teams. So paradoxically, shareholder pressure and shareholder um, pay, say, can actually be to the detriment of shareholder value. What do investors think is important? Well, investors would want to avoid controversy with many other parties, employees, customers, and policymakers. And while that might not seem too surprising, it's probably intuitive to all practitioners, that is something which is outside of many academic models, so future research should try to look at the influence of these other parties on the pay setting process. Now, the second set of questions that Tom Dirk and I look at is what determines the level of pay? Now, first, we look at this in the context of a new CEO. So when hiring a CEO for the first time, how much do we pay her? Not surprisingly, and hopefully reassuringly, the most important thing is her ability. Higher ability CEO should be paid more. Now, the next most important is CEO pay at peer firms. And you might think, well, that's kind of obvious, right? Don't you need to pay the CEO in line with her peers? But in fact, it's pretty surprising. Why? In standard models, the only reason that you need to have competitive pay is to stop the CEO leaving to another company and to make sure that you're able to hire your preferred CEO away from her old job. But notice we already have responses for those two things. CEO pay should be high enough to attract the CEO away from her previous position and also ensure that the CEO doesn't go elsewhere to a competitor. Now, if there was a peer company within the same industry with no vacancy, that should be irrelevant, right? The CEO could not have moved to that position because there was no job opening. But the fact that CEO pay at peer firms matters, even if there is no retention or recruitment concern, 
is really surprising. And this points to the idea again of fairness. Remember the CEO will compare her pay with some reference point to determine whether she's been treated fairly. And one reference point is the pay at other companies within the industry. And so just if you're paid less than your peers, even if you had no hope of moving to the company because there was no vacancy, you might feel undervalued and demotivated. I think this is interesting because many people will look at the market forces explanation for high pay and say, well, CEOs don't move between companies that often. Therefore, the whole idea of paying your CEO well to stop them leaving, that just doesn't make sense. But in fact, right, if there is this fairness element that you feel that you should be paid what is fair and one benchmark for what is fair is what others are getting, that is a reason why you pay, pay should be kept up with the market. Now, whether it's correct for the correct benchmark for fairness to be pay rather than something else, that's a separate conversation. All I'm saying is for now, at least according to the respondents, pay is the benchmark CEOs use to see whether they're being treated fairly by the board and investors. Now, one other thing we ask is what causes you to increase pay from year to year? Now, the biggest answer here is good recent CEO performance. If the CEO has done a good job, her pay should go up. Now, again, you might think, well, that's kind of obvious, right? High pay, high performance should indeed lead to high pay. But in fact, it's pretty surprising. Right? What does any researcher in CEO pay learn whenever they start doing research on this? Is that the main source of a CEO's incentives is not their salary and bonus, but it's the previously granted stock and options that they have. For example, Steve Jobs was famously paid $1 a year. But that doesn't mean that he had no incentives. He had $2 billion of stock in his company. And indeed, Tom and I have commonly said, right, you cannot look at a CEO's incentives without looking at their stock and options. But what this answer suggests is that we might have been partly wrong. Right? There is a special role played by changes in salary and bonus. And why? This might be because of the importance of recognition. Say the CEO does a great job and say her pay doesn't change from year to year. And instead she's only rewarded by the increase in the value of her stock and options. Right, that is something where that happens automatically. There is no real um, at discretionary action needed by the board or investors. You contrast that with a pay rise. That pay rise needs to be discretionally decided by the board. It needs to be approved by investors. So that's much greater recognition of the CEO doing a good job than simply her stock going up in value. Indeed, as one director highlighted, we need to recognize achievement. The retrospective acknowledgement of exceptional performance is important. And perhaps our cheekiest question on the level of pay is asking if your firm reduced the level of pay of the next CEO by one third, what might happen? And out of all of the questions that we have, this is the one that captures most of the disagreement between directors and investors. So actually the most popular response for investors is there would be no adverse consequences. They think that you could reduce pay by as much as one third, and you would not recruit a lower quality CEO. Right? Some of them argue that actually um, CEO should not be money motivated, Yes, you might cut out many potential CEOs, but the ones who scared away are not the ones who you'd want to motivate, you'd want to hire to begin with. Directors, in contrast, think that you would significantly be reducing the talent pool by doing so. So my, my, my final one or two minutes, let me just go through one result on variable pay. So this is the structure of incentives. And what we asked is, well, why do you offer the CEO variable pay. We had a question, which I'm not showing in the interest of time, which argues that the main source of motivation for a CEO is intrinsic motivation and reputation. That's what you'd hope. You'd hope that the CEO is, is, is at the company, not to get rich, but because she just loves doing the job. However, many directors and investors still thought that you should have financial incentives. And the reason for this, again, is fairness. Right, so if you've done a fantastic job, 
even if you would have done that great job anyway, because you are intrinsically motivated, it is not unfair for you to be rewarded for that after the fact. Indeed, one investor said to us that you would have to be a superhuman if you were motivated only through intrinsic reasons and was delivering great performance year after year without any sort of recognition. So again, many people look at the incentive packages and think, well, that means that CEOs are really greedy. They're not intrinsically motivated. They need to be paid to perform well. But this suggests something else. Yes, maybe you'd have done a good job anyway because you're intrinsically motivated, but it is not unfair to be rewarded after the fact that is something where any normal human would like to be recognized for a job well done. Okay, thanks very much to everybody for, for their attention. Really looking forward to the, the comments of the practitioners.